they took us to the next level of new addition coming out of the, the little boy band stage and going into men. We brought Johnny into the group on that album. And it was just a lot of transition things going on that Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, they made happen in the way that you saw us. When we look at that album, we saw a lot of growth and a lot of change in new addition right there. What's up, YouTube? Back at you with another video. If you haven't already, check out my video essays on Ralph Tresvant's Living in a Dream, Bobby Brown's Mystical Magic, New Edition's Tender Love, Every Little Step, as well as the album retrospectives on the Candy Girl, New Edition, All for Love, King of Stage, Under the Blue Moon, and Chemistry. In each video, I dive into interesting topics not commonly known about New Edition. Following the release of New Edition's Under the Blue Moon album, tensions between Ralph Tresvant and the other members of New Edition reached a breaking point. Without Bobby Brown, more emphasis was placed on Ralph, who would sing lead on nine of the ten songs on the album, relegating Ronnie, Ricky, and Mike further into background roles, creating a personal divide that would extend offstage. The culmination of these issues, in addition to seeing Bobby Brown's solo success, would fuel Ralph's solo aspirations, threatening the group's future. In this video, I'll be discussing the history leading up to and slightly after the Heartbreak album. While you're here, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button, and without further ado, let's get into it. In 1987, New Edition will receive the award for Favorite R&B Soul Group at the American Music Awards. Immediately after the ceremony, a standoff occurred between Ralph and the other members, where the resentments of the latter were made clear, resulting in a falling out and a total breakdown in communication. Ronnie, Ricky, and Mike will be forced to perform without him for the first time at the Lou Rawls Parade of Stars Telethon. Ralph will begin working on what would have been his first solo album, Living in a Dream. Aware of Ralph's intentions to go solo, Michael Bivens would approach Johnny Gill at a concert and offer him the opportunity to join New Edition. Talking, yo, what's happening, all that kind of stuff. Um, but um, I, you know, we we hung out uh, briefly, and then um, uh, I want to say Michael was probably the one business that uh, yeah. yeah, you know that that I was at a show at a concert, a Whispers concert in L.A. He was the one that uh, said, yo, can let me holler at you for a minute. And he goes, <laughs> do you, uh, so let me ask you a question. Like, 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 do you feel like you got your just do like as a singer? And I looked and I did this and I went. Mm. He put a nice empty pocket. <laughs> no, <just>. not really. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he asked me and invited me to come to lunch the next day with them. And I was like, sure, because I was in L.A. I wasn't doing anything and went to lunch and I'm thinking nothing about it. Then he, he asked me, uh, say, you want to come check our show out because we were playing. They was doing the ice capades or something. So I said, yeah, no problem. Then he calls <laughs> I'm sorry, me. sorry, wait. Ice capades, <laughs> wow. <laughs> that doesn't exist anymore? Is that not a thing? No, just New Edition <laughs> and Ice Capades. <laughs> <laughs> they actually performed at the somewhere in there. New Edition like, on Ice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just a halftime show. Just a halftime. I know. I'm not clowning. So, Guys, don't kill so, me. I love y'all. <laughs> so then they asked me, they invited me to to lunch again the next day. And I'm going, what the hell? I said, um, yeah, I'll come. And that's when we sat around and started talking. And then they asked me about... Um, being a part of the group, they were talking about they wanted to go back to having a five, a, a fifth mm -hmm. member so that they can, the choreography can look more effective mm -hmm. and more. A little did I know it was far from what that was. I had no idea that there was the kind of turmoil that was going on inside of that group. But right. It was just something that just happened. But, you know, ultimately, um, uh, I believe that uh, it was just fate and destiny that this was where we were supposed to be. Johnny Gill. Having released two solo albums to minimal success and not being well received by the public due to his contrasting image and voice would accept the offer. The pairing of Johnny Gill and Stacey Lattisaw had been his most successful effort. Joining New Edition would prove to be the reintroduction he needed, temporarily halting production on his third solo album under Motown. Meanwhile, Ralph Tresnant would approach Gerald Busby and MCA with Living in a Dream in hopes to release it. However, Gerald Busby, who was already aware of Johnny Gill's joining of New Edition, was more interested in another group album rather than living in a dream. Gerald also asserted that Ralph Tresnant was contractually bound to MCA and obligated to record another New Edition album. Under the circumstances, Ralph would not be able to secure a solo deal with another label without MCA's legal consent. Gerald would make it clear that he did not need a New Edition without Ralph Tresnant and enticed his involvement with the inclusion 
of Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Ultimately, Ralph would shelve living in a dream and return to the group to begin work on Heartbreak. What happened was I was working on a project called Living in a Dream and I was getting ready to actually release this album. And I was stepped to by uh, MCA. And they basically kind of had it in a stronghold. I couldn't do music anywhere else because of the contract new edition was in, but I could have done something with them. But they wanted me to wait till I did another new edition album. Pretty much told me, you know, if you hold out, I'll make sure you're good. Just do another new edition album for me. And I said, okay, fine. The legendary producers, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, were brought in to write and produce the vast majority of the album. Former member of the time, Jelly Bean Johnson, would also contribute to the album, as well as frequent flight time collaborator, Lisa Keith. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis would start their career with my all-time favorite band, The Time, playing keyboard and bass guitar, respectively. By 1982, Jam and Lewis would start recording for other artists such as Change, Climax, and the SOS Band. The following year, their production and songwriting success would begin with Just Be Good To Me and Tell Me If You Still Care by the SOS Band. Just Be Good To Me was released as a single in 1983 and reached number 55 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 2 on the R&B chart while Tell Me If You Still Care reached number 65 on the Hot 100 and number 5 on the R&B chart. Their involvement with the SOS band caught Prince's attention, whose banner Jam and Lewis were still under via the time. They were not allowed to write or produce for outside acts, and in doing so, Prince fired them from the time. Shortly thereafter, the success of the aforementioned songs was enough to sustain their careers without Prince or the time. Going on to work with Sherelle and Alexander O'Neill, enhancing their vocal talents, not only with their songwriting and production, but also their vocal arranging. Both artists would duet on Saturday Love, released as a single on October 16, 1985. It reached number 26 on the Hot 100 and number 2 on the R&B chart. That same year, Jam and Lewis would create the R&B classic love ballad, Tender Love, sung by the Force MDs. Tender Love would go on to be their highest charting pop hit to date, released as a single on December 5, 1985 and reaching number 10 on the Billboard Hot 100. In 1986, Jam and Lewis would work with, who will go on to become their musical muse, Janet Jackson, who had already released two albums, Janet Jackson and Dream Street, to minimal success relative to her brothers. Neither albums were able to capture her true attitude, nor were they songs she actually wanted to sing. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis were approached to work with Janet, and they would go on to create the Control album, spawning seven singles, five of which reached the top ten on the Billboard Hot 100, with When I Think of You reaching number one. Jam and Lewis would further cement their status as bona fide hit makers, producing Human League's fifth studio album, Crash, and writing their hit, Human. Released as a single on August 11, 1986, and reaching number one on the Billboard Hot 100 and charting well worldwide. Throughout New Edition's career, they would be unhappy with their bubblegum pop sound and had long to be given songs that reflected their age and maturity. Working with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis was a match made in heaven considering the transitional period the group was in. The prelude to New Edition's first collaboration with Jam and Lewis would come in the form of Helplessly in Love that appeared on the Dragnet film soundtrack in 1987. Work would begin on the Heartbreak album at Flight Time Studios in Minneapolis. In the midst of recording, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis would pause production, sensing tensions between Ralph and the other group members. Ralph would find out that Johnny Gill was now a member of New Edition without his opinion being considered. And so. When I got up to leave to go to Minneapolis, ecstatic because we're getting ready to work with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who at the time had become my favorite producers. Oh, we're getting ready to go in the studio with the beasts right now. We're getting ready to do a dishing fit to come up. All right, I'll do that album. So I get down to Minneapolis, and lo and behold, Johnny Gill's there. He felt like he was being replaced because there was no communication between the four of us at the time. It was just a total breakdown in communication because we didn't find out that Ralph got offended until we were actually doing the movie. I didn't realize that there were uh, issues going on, obviously, until I actually got there. All hell broke loose. <laughs> I'll never forget Ralph was talking about, you know, he had never agreed to this move and that he was not willing to split his money five ways again. It came off like, F you, Ralph, we're putting Johnny in the group. We weren't thinking that then, we were thinking, how do we continue? They had already been looking for a new lead singer, unbeknownst to me. So when I got to Minneapolis, Johnny was there as this new member slash lead singer. 
They could feel the tension. That's what it was. There became a point where I was like, Who's this? I'm barely talking to them, barely talking to them. It was that kind of tension at that point, you know? I've heard and I know what it is. You're trying to replace me, Joe told me. They didn't say anything. And when he said to come down there, he didn't say that Johnny was coming down there either, nor did the rest of the group members. They hadn't told me that either. So when I got there, he was there. And I'm like, yo, what is going on? We're like, whoa, wait a minute now. Have you talked this over with the group? And I don't even know if the group had any knowledge of it, but it was um, a really tense moment. And the, you could feel the tension because Ralph didn't know what was really going on. He was like, you ain't telling this man that there's going to be another. And it, well, you know, I was trying, and that's how Mike talked. Well, you know, I, I was trying, I, we was going to, but we didn't have time because everybody was, you know, that's getting in his whole bib thing. Well, it was, it, was, it was very obvious. It was just real standoffish, no real camaraderie. It was a lot of um, just running through, you know, walking through the motions. Okay. Like that way. Well, you know, everybody's slow to move, slow to this. Um, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis eventually pulled us to the side and said, man, look, they, they grabbed us all. <laughs> they stopped on one session. We was coming to the studio, and they stopped the whole movement and said, look, we need to have a, 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 a meeting. So we all sat down in one of the rooms, the conference, conference room in flight time. And we, uh, and they had they put it on the table. Man, what's going on, man? This tension is so thick, you can, you can cut it with a knife, blah, 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 blah. They went down the whole line, what's going on? So I was spit what I had to say. I said, first of all, man, I would appreciate how they're just going to come and bring in a, a member in the group. If Bob ain't coming back, nobody really talked to me about it. I had this I haven't had this conversation with anybody. I'm not cool with it. We hadn't talked about it. It was just kind of being done. What people don't realize is that when Johnny was brought to the table, he wasn't brought in to replace Bobby Brown. He was brought in to pl replace me. Johnny was brought in, and they finally sat us down. And me and Johnny became, after that meeting, Johnny didn't know this. Johnny didn't even know that was going on. So that was blew his mind when he was sitting in the meeting and heard all of that. We got together after that meeting. And uh, we laughed, we talked, we went back, back and forth on just what what these guys do and how they move. It's like, wow, I don't believe that. It's like, yeah, man, that's, he, wasn't, he wasn't brought in to replace Bobby. He was brought in to replace me. I saw recently that they were just saying that they didn't know that, you know, that wasn't sure that that, um, or wasn't aware that what Ralph, Ralph was talking about right. was going took solo, place. Yeah. But um, I remember distinctively, I was there when the first day when we got into the whole shouting match and all that stuff, um, Ralph and I wind up, and, and it was so funny because we wind up talking like every day. Once we was finished from recording, we would go and sit down either his room or my room. We were sitting there and just talking. And I remember when Ralph told me about the fact that he had uh, all the things, the way he was being treated, uh, and he was talking about the sacrifices that he had made with the fact that they been they was asking him to go solo a long time ago. And he was like, everything was about, you know, what are the guys going to do? Mm -hmm. What are the guys going to do? So the thing that you got to understand when you're an artist, and Rob was the lead singer, mm -hmm. um, not being able to be free at some point creatively to do some things, and you have to stay in this, in this, you know, this bubble right. and certain things because they had a sound, they had a, you know, a style. You know, so I think that was more frustrating for him more than anything. But, you know, I, I mean, I know... We discussed it, and, I, and we talked about it back then. So I was, you know, I'm, maybe they didn't. I don't know, but uh, I was aware. And we knew before we could even start any sort of creative anything, we needed to clear the air on that. So we got in our conference room, and Johnny was sitting at the head of the table, and everybody's sitting around the table. And we just said to Johnny, here's the deal, Johnny. You're not going to sing any songs on the album. Mm. Because this is Ralph's group, and that's the song that everybody knows, and that's what it's going to be. So how you feel about that? We didn't know what he was going to say. Mm -hmm. But Johnny said, hey, I'm cool, man. I'm a team player, man. Whatever you need. I'll do whatever it is. Well, as soon as he said that, everything in the room was cool. And actually, Ralph and Johnny turned into like the Mutual Admiration Society because Ralph would go in and sing like every background part. And then everybody would just kind of copy his backgrounds. But he'd go in for hours and, you know, six hours and just do backgrounds. And Johnny would sit with us at the board and just go, man, how's he do that? I don't get that. And then Johnny would go in and do his thing, and he'd be quick. He'd be like a half hour maybe, but do his thing. And Ralph would go, man, I don't know how he does that. So it turned into a mutual admiration society, and that's why that record got done. The group, having finally addressed the issues and cleared the air, recording work would resume. 
The album starts with the perfect introduction that literally sets the stage for New Edition's return as a quintet. That's the way we're living, written and produced collectively by each member and co-produced by Jelly Bean Johnson. Fraught with cheers from an audience, the song simulates the energy of a live New Edition concert, making known the perfectionism that goes into New Edition's performances with lyrics. We're working hard, we're striving for perfection because that's the way we're living. Perfection's hard, that's why we're working overtime. A pledge that has remained true even to this day with performances nothing short of perfect for the fans. Midway into the song, a short break is taken for Jelly Bean Johnson's guitar solo. A rich listen due to the fact that Jelly Bean is known for his drumming skills, a true multi-instrumentalist. Ricky Bell sings a mantra that could be applied to anyone's life with lyrics, it's up to you, so don't you let nobody tell you what to do. Make up your mind, cause life should be taken one day at a time. In the latter portion of the song, Johnny Gill makes his entrance with his strong vocals in full swing, coming to an abrupt end that's met with applause and setting the bar high for the rest of the album. The next song, Where It All Started, a lyrical response to their absence and to other artists who tried to copy their style not realizing where it all started from. Strong statements backed up by stronger percussion. Because other people imitate and try their best to recreate, so they only perpetrate, but they can never duplicate. It's nice to be the original that all the counterfeits like to bite off. The song tips his hat to Candy Girl, Cool It Now, and Count Me Out stating loud and clear that New Edition was and still is the definitive boy band that kicked down the door for other groups to follow. That's the way we're living is the arrival, where it all started from, was the introductory statement. If it isn't love comes next, which is the first true combination of Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis with New Edition in rare vocal form. The most mature iteration of New Edition songs about love and heartbreak. The song's production and tempo complement the song's lyrics, going back and forth about his feelings for his past love interest, confessing that love has to be the cause for his churning emotions about her. How does it feel? I can't describe this feeling that came when I saw her last night. She got to me. I'll let you know the reason I saw her with another guy. At the insistence of Brooke Payne, the song was produced with live choreography in mind. When people ask about the little breaks in the song, whereas the do -do 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 and all those kind of things like that, that was because Brooke Payne, as we were making the record, was always like, man, give me some stuff that, you know, I can do some choreography to and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we were like, okay, cool. With breaks in between to emphasize New Edition's movements on stage. The breaks can also be likened to a moment of clarity or an epiphany as it's followed by more honest confessions. Maybe she'll take me back. I made a big mistake. Now I can feel it. I really love her. The most sincere and relatable lyrics being, it took my heart to shatter in a thousand pieces before I had ever dropped my pride. Losing love, worrying about my image really helped me realize. If It Isn't Love is a musical masterpiece and showcases the growth in Ralph's vocal ability in conjunction with the musical and lyrical environment Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis created for him. They needed some up-tempo records that they could dance to and they could make great choreography to. So what we tried to do was do something very rhythmic, still very cool, have a great message in it. And Ralph is so silky on that song. Ralph floats across that song. It would go on to become the album's most successful song, released as a single on June 9th, 1988, and reaching number seven on the Billboard Hot 100 and number two on the R&B chart. The music video highlights New Edition's rigorous rehearsal process and their intricate and sharp choreography, staying true to New Edition's story and their return to the music scene. Beyonce would pay homage to If It Isn't Love in her music video for Love On Top using the same theme. Much like Janet Jackson, where Jamie Lewis's songwriting was inspired by conversations they had with Janet, the same can be said for New Edition, particularly on Any Heartbreak, which details the struggles of being famous singers in the limelight. People think we don't get lonely, but we're far away from home. One minute, 20,000 people, but then they go home, we're alone. It's off to another city where everybody knows my name, but when I meet that perfect honey, is it me she wants or is it my fame? A team effort where each member shines and holds down their own verse. The song's highlight is Michael Bivens' rap verse, the song making a 360 turn and briefly going from R&B to rap. The music video finishes the heartbreak saga with New Edition returning home after touring. The group showing off their signature choreography and a theme mirroring the song's lyrics. The video featured Malcolm Jamal Warner, Robert Townsend, Heavy D, and Louis Ski from Soul Train. 
Any Heartbreak was the album's final single, released on June 16, 1989, and peaked at number 13 on the R&B chart. Any Heartbreak is followed by Crucial, written by Gary Johnson and Lisa Keith, produced by Jelly Bean Johnson. Ralph's vocal delivery is the song's true hook, showing off his vocal versatility amidst the smooth yet edgy production. What drove this song home for me was New Edition's live performance of the song, particularly at the 1989 Soul Train Awards. Ralph's ability to flow in and out of choreography is inspiring, so much so that the music video was a live taping of Crucial from the Heartbreak Tour. Released as a single on January 31st, 1989, and it reached number four on the R&B chart. Crucial was also featured on the License to Drive film soundtrack. You're Not My Kind of Girl is one of the album's standout tracks. In the vein of If It Isn't Love, the song's production and instrumentation had choreography in mind. Loud drums begin the song with Johnny's voice faintly leading the way for Ralph to make his entrance. True to Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis's plan to slowly introduce Johnny Gill to listeners, Johnny Gill supports Ralph's vocals throughout the song, comparable to a duet. An interesting lyrical story is being told, where Ralph says to his love interest that she's not his kind of girl, that she's perfect just for another man. I know that you're attracted to me and I should feel the same about you. There's just something wrong, I don't know what it is that keeps us from becoming a two. It's not your looks, it's not your style, it's not the way that you carry yourself, cause you're the kind of girl that a man will be proud to call his own. But I've been in love before, so I know how it feels. The chemistry just isn't there. Ricky Bell comes in to steal the stage, adding an extra element to an already musical masterpiece, making it much greater. Sometimes a woman doesn't have that X factor, and she just doesn't do it for you. She'd be better off with another man. Amongst New Edition's many songs that I relate to, You're Not My Kind of Girl is one of them. Amongst the series of music videos for the Heartbreak album, You're Not My Kind of Girl is the climax. A peak performance, a peak in energy, and New Edition at their peak. Released as a single on September 6, 1988, and reaching number 3 on the R&B charts. The energy is brought down and balanced out with Super Lady, another collective songwriting effort by New Edition. The song's mellow instrumental soothes the ear of the listener when Ralph starts it all off. The group's vocal harmony on the chorus is the song's anchor, segueing into the second verse where Ricky's falsetto cements what Ralph had to say with lyrics, tell me that you'll always be around, show me you care. Every man needs a super lady. A face comes to mind when Ralph says, heaven must have sent you girl to be with me for always, sharing all our fantasies. The saxophone solo towards the song's end adds to the romantic drama, followed by the repeating of New Edition's harmonies. Super Lady is one of my personal favorites from Heartbreak and for sure one of the album's standout tracks. The album's ninth song is Can You Stand the Rain, engaging the senses with chirping birds that precede rainfall. Johnny Gill finally makes his arrival as a lead vocalist, stepping into the spotlight with his first verse, with Ralph joining in to share the vocal space. In the words of Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis is lyric master, weaving a powerful message within the song. On a perfect day, I know that I can count on you. When that's not possible, tell me can you weather the storm? Because I need somebody who will stand by me through the good times and bad times. She will always, always be right there. Can You Stand the Rain points out the fact that although relationships are beautiful, they don't come without their storms. Will she be able to weather those storms and be there when it rains? A definitive combination of Ralph, Johnny, and Ricky, who comes in towards the end of the song posing the question, tell me can you stand it? Stand the Rain is the album's definitive song and the one most associated with the album, going on to become a generational classic. Released as a single on December 13, 1988, and reaching number 44 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 1 on the R&B chart. 
Can You Stand the Rain went on to be covered by Boys to Men in 1997 on their album Evolution. Also featured in the 2013 film The Best Man Holiday, where the characters put on an impromptu performance of the song. Competition is the next song on the album, written by Ralph, co-produced by Ralph and Jellybean Johnson. A heartfelt and sincere ballad detailing the interpersonal issues that separate people, plagued by unfriendly competition, hoping that one day we can all find common ground and be as one. With lyrics, because if we all just take the time, I'm sure that we will find all of us shed blood of the same kind. And that's the bottom line. My favorite portion is Ricky's lyrics, if we're ever gonna be as one, we better make some changes and fast, and this time make it last. The long saxophone riffs complement the song's lyrical content. It's written that the song partly addressed Bobby's departure from New Edition years prior. The slow tempo of the album is maintained with I'm Coming Home. The song begins with 808s that lead into the light keyboards and smooth synthesizers. I'm Coming Home is a three-sided vocal performance from Ralph, Johnny, and Ricky, each giving the song a different look. Relatable lyrics, save tomorrow for me, I'm coming home to you. Since the day I left and you went on your own way, my life's just not the same. I'm needing you and longing for your touch. Can I get a message through? Ricky ties the knot on his verse in a way only he can conveying his message on a high note. Johnny Gill makes his way into the song, and the song briefly takes the form of a solo Johnny Gill song, slowing down and repeating a way too long, Missing You So, I'm Coming Home, showing off the song's third dimension. Home is where the heart is, and Ralph comes in to further emphasize that. The album rightfully ends with Boys to Men, a song that tells New Edition's coming of age story up until that point. Johnny Gill takes the lead with Ralph supporting with background vocals. So we search for answers to our questions. No answers, but we're taught a lesson every time. Through mistakes we've learned to gather wisdom. Life's responsibility falls in our hands. Keep on learning, keep on growing, because wisdom helps us understand. The goals we set may exceed reality, because failure always is a possibility. Voice to Men accurately details the personal struggles and obstacles young men face coming up through life. Johnny Gill didn't like the song, saying he'd rather have sang Can You Stand the Rain on his own rather than Boys to Men. Here, Jam just hit me now and says, uh -oh. Uh -oh. ask him why did he hate singing Boys to Men. Oh, that's the song. Yeah. Dang, Johnny. Yeah. You know, when Terry told me, he said, you're probably not going to sing any songs on the album. And then I wind up start singing songs like Can You Stand the Rain and doing ad libs and all that stuff. And I'm going, shoot, I'm thinking, why well, can't you just sing that song? So, right. And, um, after out of all those great songs, the very last song that they they, they decided they was gonna let me do a lead full lead on was Boys to Men. So I'm going, oh, this isn't some, some some political bullshit. <laughs> I was like, okay, really? I, I think they just messing with me now because they just and I said, oh, okay, so they're gonna give me this piece of bull to sing as a whole full song. And so I said, like you know what? messages in the song. Wait, time out. Wait, wait, time out though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. And so I was that, mad. That... I was really mad. Like. Angry. Trying to tell you to grow up? But wait a minute. <laughs> Listen, it's 19... All right, that one came out in 87, correct? 88. Yeah, 88. 88. It's 80, so I'm assuming you recorded it in 87? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Jim and Lewis are at the height of their powers at this point. Yeah. 
You had an opinion on a Jam and Lewis song? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In 87? Yeah, because you got to remember, I had already sang uh, on Can You Stand the Rain and um, um, uh, You're Not My Kind of Girl. Uh, and Any uh, Heartbreak. Uh, any Heartbreak. And I'm, they let me unleash. And then it was like, okay, now we're going to give you a song for yourself. And I'm going, what the hell? Like, uh, really? I just said, okay, so you want to play with me? I said, I'm going to sing the shit out of this song. <laughs> oh, so I'm going to show y'all about fucking with me. Yo. And that's why I Fair went in there. Spill. I was mad. Fair hold, use. On, hold on, And I sang mad as hell. I was like, okay, yeah, you want to play with me? That was you mad? That was me mad. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. Because it... I kept thinking, man, this is bullshit. I all these good songs. They're going to give me this one? Nonetheless, the song's impact would transcend the group and its time with future R&B group Voice to Men naming themselves after the song. Heartbreak would go on to be certified double platinum, becoming the group's definitive album. The group would reunite with Bobby Brown, who had released his second solo album, Don't Be Cruel, for the Heartbreak Tour. Al B is great, new edition, that is a great package. It really is. It's a heartbreak package. Yeah, oh, it is. Bobby Brown would reach superstardom, which further fueled the group to pursue solo careers heading into 1990. If you made it to the end of this video, I hope you enjoyed it. Please be sure again to like, comment, subscribe, let me know your thoughts, and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.